Well, there's been an alarming increase in domestic violence in WA over the past decade, with police statistics revealing family violence offences, including assault and threatening behaviour, have more than doubled in 10 years. Police across the country deal with an average 657 domestic violence matters each day, or one every two minutes. WA is now second to the Northern Territory for rates of family violence. So what impact are restraining orders having on our legal system to debate the issue? Let's bring in lawyers John Hammond and Michelle Cox. Good afternoon to you both. Good afternoon, Tracy. John, we'll start with you first. How are family violence restraining orders clogging up our justice system? Well, there's so many of them being applied for um, that it's taking enormous amounts of court time. There's hearing dates that are required and courtroom time needs to be allocated to them. So they are literally flooding the courts. Michelle, what's your take on that? In my experience, that's correct. That you can wait five, six, 12 months from start to finish to have a matter heard initially. Somebody objects to it, the other party, and then you finally get bef before a magistrate to say your side of the story and the other party says their story. OK, it so... It take a long time. All right, so what should be done then to alleviate... John, I'll go back to you, to alleviate the pressure on the system while still protecting those from domestic violence because it's taking such a long time. Well, there needs to be a way of weeding out the really weak complaints. So it's at this point in time with the law the way it is now, you only have to fear violence or have an apprehension of violence and you could go and apply for a restraining order. So you think some of them are, are unnecessary? Some of them are unnecessary and they're done to embarrass uh, the person that you've just separated from. They're done to cause that other person expense so they have to run off to lawyers. Okay. Uh, they're just far too easy to get. All right, Michelle, well, what do you think about that? Do you think most of them are unnecessary? Are, putting, are we putting, uh, putting people at risk here? And are there any long-term support systems out there? I think there are people who are caught up in the mix of it for the wrong reasons and they are diluting the real need for those people who do require it for urgent matters. The same people who are requiring really urgent attention, whether there's kids involved, uh, mortgages to be paid, different aspects of it financially or property or children related, need to be addressed more quickly to alleviate the pressure on both parties in the longer term. One solution might be to, re to somehow create a dedicated shoot or avenue for these DV-related matters within the court system itself. Okay. We've, had, we've had drug histories, drug courts, Aboriginal courts, we've had those types of things and it might be time to explore other avenues here to test the materials before we wait that long six to 12 months. OK, what about repeat offenders? Should the courts be changing the way they deal with them? I think the difficulty with repeat offenders is that they must be taken on a merits base for each case. Not every repeat offence is as serious as, as the next. Obviously somebody threatening to hurt or harm somebody is quite serious, but it's not as... and then that requires some act, action by the court, but other technical or non-compliance things such as sending money via EFT to a, the other party is considered a breach of an order and therefore a repeat offender. So a person trying to send money for their children or other means or to pay the rent for the the house that they were all in can sometimes be caught up in that system and, okay. uh, and find themselves subject to criminal proceedings that aren't necessary. All right. Uh, John and Michelle, we'll have to leave it there, but thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Yeah, thank you. Thank Speak you. to you next time.